way spanning slab. The one way spanning slab is the simplest form of the slab, where the loops on the slab is to be transferred in one direction to the adjacent beam member. Among all these five types of the slab, the one way slab and also the band beam and slab systems are under the category of one way spanning slab. This kind of system is applicable for the slab with a span between 8 meters to 18 meters. For this kind of system, the standard beam and slab system may be adopted. The design steps are outlined here, which include the determining the specifications of the strengths, conducting the load analysis, load balancing and the pre-stress load, calculations of the geometrical property, calculations of the losses, and also checking the stress limits. In terms of the load analysis, these are the typical load analysis that you also learn in the reinforced concrete design. Basically, it is the moment distribution method where you're going to distribute the loops to the opposite support and so on and so forth. For the moment distribution methods, you will need to determine the stiffness of the member based on the equations given here, and then calculate the distribution factors, which later the fixed end moment will be distributed in terms of the ratio for these distribution factors and there will be various load combinations that you will need to try in order for you to produce the envelope shear force diagram and the bending moment diagram. As the design step here involves the analysis for the serviceability limit state, the factor of safety will be taken as 1.0. There will be combinations of loads in terms of the maximum and minimum, where the minimum loads will represent the weight of the slab, while the maximum load will involve the weight of the slab plus the GK and QK. By doing this moment distribution methods for all these load combinations, you will be able to produce the envelope shear force and bending moment diagram. And then based on the bending moment diagram produced, you can propose a appropriate tendon profile for the sections for the purpose of the loop balancing. And you will propose adequate pre-stressing loop to best to counteract the loops acting on this lap. The slide here presents the calculations for the permittable jacking force of the tendon. In fact, this has been discussed in the previous chapter. The maximum allowable jacking force is given by the equation here, which is defined by the maximum allowable stress in the tendons times the areas of the tendon. The areas of the tendon will be dependent on the type and the size of the tendon, which can be referred from this table. As for the maximum allowable stress in the tendon, it will be the smaller value of the two. One is defined by XFPK, that means the characteristic ultimate stress. Another one is defined by SFP 0.1K which is the characteristic yield stress of the tendon. In the case that FP0.1K is not given, it is considered about 0.85 FPK. The FPK can be obtained from this table also, and substitute the FPK and FP0.1K into the equations you are able to define the permittable jacking force for the tendon. This represents the typical tendon profile for a beam. You know that the continuous member will have moment at the mid-span and negative moment at the intermediate supports. 
you would like to take the advantage of the resistance generated by the pre-stressing force to counteract the loads acting on the member. Preferably, the moment resistance generated by the pre-stressing force is totally equal to the loads acting on the member. The tendon profile here will mimic the bending moment diagram and for the regions of the sharp turning, we made the transition curve in order to minimize the losses due to the friction. This leads to a situation having the eccentricity at the mid-span and negative eccentricity at the intermediate support. If you cut the sections here, that will give you three different types of the sections. At the end support here, which represent the section here, there is no eccentricity. At the mid span here, there will be positive eccentricity. And the effective depth D will be here. And for the intermediate support, due to the negative moment, there will be negative eccentricity where the tendons is positioned above the centroid. The effective depth now is referring to the surface of the slab. Next, we can quantify the equivalent load based on the tendon profile. The P here represents the pre-stressing force which is applied constant throughout the slab. The L here represents the effective span of each segment. And there will be a term known as the trap. It refers to the effective eccentricity as reference to the positions of the tendons at the start and the end of the segment. This trap can be calculated from this equation here or it can be solved graphically based on the figures here. Taking this as an example, if all three eccentricities are below the neutral axis, the thread here will represent the distance from the largest curvatures to the imaginary line that joins the first eccentricity and the end eccentricity here. Let's say now for the case that you have negative eccentricity at both end and positive eccentricity at the mid span, you will need to first draw the imaginary line and find the distance from the eccentricity 2 to this imaginary line here. You can always solve this finding the drag here graphically by sketching the profiles of the tendons segment by segment. From there, you are able to define the equivalent load. The most ideal conditions is for you to generate an equivalent load which is same as the loads acting on the member so that they can cancel out each other and the pre-stress slab will be safe. Normally for the design of the slab, as long as we can propose a pre-stressing load and the tendon profile and that generates an equivalent load that can totally eliminate the stresses in the member, you will know that the proposed design for the pre-stressing slabs is acceptable. However, due to some other possible considerations, you might not be able to totally eliminate the loads. Therefore, it is always a good practice for us to check for the stress limit along the member. With that, you will need to determine the geometrical properties of the section as well as to quantify the actual losses in the member and check for the stress limits at the critical sections along the member. Taking this as a continuous member, having the constant eccentricity along the length, there will be at least three sections that you need to check, which is this, 
this and this and probably this this is provided the section here is symmetrical both sides if the setup of the beam here is not symmetrical you will need to check for every critical sections here also in some design here you might change the magnitude of the eccentricity here so as to better fit the conditions of the external load for the load balancing purposes then you will have to check for every single section to make sure none of the sections fail in terms of the stress limit now let us come to the concept of the stress limit this is basically same as what we have discussed in the previous chapters you will have to draw the stress diagram based on the stress diagram you propose the equations for you to determine the stress in the member through superpositions and the calculated stress here is to be checked against the stress limits there will be critical conditions for the top and bottom beam at the transfer and at the service and the limits for the compressions and the tensions are defined based on the equation here all this has been discussed in the previous chapters